thank you, Tamara, for that lovely introduction. And Huala Lepa for the invitation to speak here today at this important symposium. I'm Shay Hawk from the Mediterranean Institute oh, no, for Environmental Studies at Zurisa Copa. And you've seen the title of my paper, so let's go straight into it. We have been changing the face of the earth and its waters for some time now. But let's do a Western history recap to bring us up to date on the Anthropocene and the climate change times that we're living in. So firstly, I'll assume a basic understanding of the earth system and the water cycle, because my focus is water, um, and begin with the last period of geological time, which was the Holocene. So in about the early 1800s, the industrial era started to happen. Um, and Stefan Kutzen and McNeil, who I will reference throughout this paper, talk about that as stage one of the Anthropocene. Um, during this time, we began to see uh, small manufacturing, uh, the invention of the steam engine that might have happened earlier, um, but the big move from the country and rural areas to the cities um, and the increasingly mechanised way of life. Stage two of the Anthropocene is called the Great Acceleration, and it starts from about 1945, so post-World War II. Uh, in this phase, we um, were so happy to be liberated from the war um, that we had all of this technological knowledge and all of these people, and we started creating, in the West anyway, uh, gadgets and um, machines uh, to make life easier for us. So the car became very popular, washing machines and so on. But we also started to get involved in hyper-production of agriculture and crops. So we used superphosphates uh, quite recklessly actually. Um, and we did a lot of manufacturing and the runoff or the waste products from some of those industries were sent straight to the sea or the rivers of the world untreated. So here we are in stage three of the Anthropocene. Um, Stephen Kutz and McNeil say 2015, but I could say, I would say from the turn of the century, we've started to notice that the legacy we've inherited from this great acceleration period now demands some reparation. We have to actually do some things to stop uh, the denaturing of the planet and to promote um, all life on earth, not just human life, and become stewards of the earth system or guardians. It's time to rethink how we do life on planet earth. So life is contingent on understanding our connections between the ground that we stand on, the air we breathe, and the water that falls free from the tap. It's all interconnected through complex adaptive systems. And the water cycle is a great example of the confluence, dynamism and flux of the Earth system. Yet the distribution of water on the planet is very interesting. Let's have a look at this painting by a friend of mine, Leonie Jackson, who visually represents the water, re the water distribution on the planet. So all of those big blue and aqua squares represent the ocean. So we know that 75% of the planet is water. So all of those blue squares are the ocean. And if you can see down in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a white rectangle. That's the fresh water supply on planet Earth. And the tiny blue dot inside that rectangle is how much fresh water is accessible. So when you see it like this, it kind of brings home just how much fresh water we don't have. Now we've got lots in Slovenia, uh, pretty lucky there, uh, but other plants, parts of the world have been less lucky. So it's very intelligent, particularly now, to be very careful with this 1%. As climate change increases, as we know already, the oceans warm and swell and re-territorialize atolls and islands and low-level coastal cities and compromise the life of aquaculture and sea ecosystems. It makes sense to be careful with all of our natural resources, but my focus today is water and our adaptive capacity to work towards a resilient future 
by understanding the dynamic and biosocial relations of the bloodstream of the planet. One of the ways that we can do this is by being aware of the planetary boundaries, the nine planetary boundaries, which is spoken about by the, from the um, Stockholm Resilience Centre, and also the safe operating space for the planet to operate on. So safe operating space for humanity is based on intrinsic biophysical um, products and production to regulate the stability of the Earth system. But we've got three choices in how we go further into the future in relation to maintaining the safe operating space. So there's the business as usual approach. Um, so in the Anthropocene, uh, business institutions and economic systems that have driven the great acceleration still continue to dominate human affairs. And this really must stop. Another possibility, and this is the one that I'll be promoting and that I think we're all here to promote, is the mitigation pathways. So alternative pathways. And the ultimate goal here is to reduce human modification of the global environment, and we can do that locally as well, to avoid dangerous or difficult to control levels and rates of change. So the pace of change is important here as well. And ultimately, we want to allow the Earth system to function in a pre-Anthropocene way. This must be us. Um, and I'm not saying we have to go completely rewild and, and tribal, but there are some things from the past that could really serve us now. There's great wisdom there. The other option, of course, is geoengineering. Um, and we have seen some of this already in the world. So that's the purposeful manipulation by humans of global scale earth system processes with the intention of countering anthropogenically driven environmental change, such as greenhouse warming. Now, we have already begun to um, act around this, but there is a warning here not to be over-dependent on geoengineering options. If we become over-dependent, um, we end up mimicking uh, nature and, and cycles that exist in nature, uh, rather than working with nature. So working with nature based solutions. To that end, I'd just like to take you for a little bit of a trip to Australia, where I am currently because of COVID. I'm sorry not to be there in Slovenia. Um, so in this slide that you can see, um, on the left is a picture of, me, of myself making a, a water documentary. And that's the Murrumbidgee River behind me on Ngunnawal country. And I acknowledge the elders of the Ngunnawal First Nations people. And on the right is where the Murrumbidgee River, so this is the river that I grew up around, where it meets the Murray River. So the Murray River is part of the Murray-Darling Basin. So it's a whole system of lots of rivers that feed into this basin. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because we don't want something like this to happen in Slovenia or anywhere more in the world. So this is pretty nice pristine, beautiful looking images there. And our water does look brown and dirty, it's not. It's just that we don't have the kind of minerals that you have um, in Slovenia in our water. We have different minerals. We don't have lots of magnesium, for example. So this Murray-Darling Basin system used to look like the image on the left um, with natural flows and different towns and different peoples, um, First Nations as well as um, settler descended peoples interacting in and around the river. But how it looks now is a deeply pipelined, uh, very geoengineered, um, it's a geoengineered dream actually. But unfortunately what it does is create obstacles and blocks to flows so that the pre-existing ecosystems can't flow through the channels that, it, that they once did. Um, a lot of this river has been pipelined um, and as we know, we do need light for photosynthesis for things to evolve and grow. So the effects on many ecosystems of this pipelining of this river have been dramatic. Um, there are some moves towards changing this, uh, mainly driven by First Nations uh, people actually, who also have heritage connections to the river. 
So I wanted to show you that little snapshot of um, an Australian river system um, that we can avoid. And in fact, um, the European Biodiversity, European Commission Biodiversity Strategy is invested in de um, damming 24,000 kilometres of water in Europe. There's funding there to do that and it's available now. If we continue to do things like damming and pipelining and desalination and dewilding rivers, we, we do create problems, not just downstream, um, but through very many different systems, including the human system. And it's our actions from the past that have created um, the problems. That's what Anthropocene means, the anthropogenic, the human impact. Um, causing problems that make sustainable life on Earth challenging. So we don't want to create any more catas catastrophic events than we're already dealing with. We do need to understand better how to use water and not waste it. Um, like I said, in Slovenia, you've got lots of it, um, but there is still wise ways that we can uh, reuse and recycle water. We do not want to create a need for desalination plants or damming. And we don't want to remove people any further from their source of life. Um, if we continue down the business as usual pathway, um, we will be faced with the end of the world as we know it. We will die of thirst. So the solution, what are the solutions? There's lots of solutions and there's lots of hope. As I mentioned, the European Commission's biodiversity strategy and the Green Deal committed to restoring not just water to a free flowing state, but to taking care of um, biodiversity and sensitive ecosystems. How we actually do that is what is important. And these kind of uh, provisions, funding provisions, um, are intended to be acted out locally. Um, so recently I um, was successful in a Horizon 2020 project called Smart Control of the Climate Resilience in European Cities. The acronym is SCORE. Um, so I'm one of 28 partners um, representing Zurisa at COPPA. Um, and the overall aim of this project, which is worth 10 million euros, is to design, develop, monitor, and validate robust adaptation measures in coastal and low-lying areas. So in Slovenia, we think of um, COPPA, uh, Isola, and Param. Um, as being the most vulnerable. Um, they've already suffered from coastal flooding. I think the weather last week was pretty intense down there in Peran when my colleagues were meeting with the municipality. So SCORE is based on co-design, co-development, deploying, testing, and demonstrating innovative, ecologically-based approaches, smart technologies, and importantly, nature-based solutions, while at the same time facilitating financial sustainability. So as part of this project, this Horizon project, this innovative project, we'll develop a water redistribution system called the SHINK to Sea. That basically is an acronym for shower to cistern to sea. So we're redistributing the water from the bathroom, from the shower into the cistern to flush the toilet, because basically it's insane to flush the toilet with fresh drinking water. It's a very simple uh, mechanism and we'll be testing it in our coastal living lab city of Peran um, in 20 households. Um, the project goes for four years, so we've got a bit of time to develop the prototype. Uh, it's a very exciting project and the municipality of Peran, of Peran is our host city for this. Um, as I said, it's not rational to flush the toilet with drinking water. Desalination is expensive and ugly, and the shink to sea is logical, affordable, discreet, intelligent, and importantly, it engages the community. Citizen scientists meets science. And it will reduce the water runoff into the sea by using the water twice, and that will reduce the pressure on the very old infrastructure that we find in these old coastal cities. So it's a win-win for the Param area, uh, for science and technology in Slovenia and for water itself, not to mention the aquacultures of the Adriatic Sea. And just to finish with, in terms of why I thought of this and why we've developed it, Slovenia has about 2 million people. 
The Western standard average for using the toilet is five times a day. The average flush is five to 10 litres. The average shower or bath is 50 to 75 litres. So the potential saving of water is 35 to 65 litres per adult per day using this innovative technology. So this is one of those good bioengineering options. So at the end of the day, the important thing to remember um, with all of our resources um, to, is to get the balance right between economic value, sociological values and resilience planning, and ecological and environmental value. If we can't get the balance right with these things, of course we need economics, um, but it has to be not as dominant as it has been. And it'll be interesting to see what plays out in Glasgow in a few weeks time. So that is um, a very brief summary of the water situation and innovative fun, uh, technology happening now in Slovenia. And I thank you very much for having me here today. I'm really looking forward to the rest of the presentations. Uh, thank you.